Captain Alan Glenn was an Apollo astronaut, and in uh, Reader's Digest, he talks about reacting in a crisis situation, and I love what he had to say about this. It sets a good tone for our lesson tonight. He says, test pilots have a litmus test for evaluating problems. When something goes wrong, they ask, is this thing still flying? And if the answer is yes, there is no immediate danger, no need to overreact. When Apollo 12 took off, the aircraft was hit by lightning. The entire console, he says, began to glow with orange and red trouble lights. There's this temptation to do something. But the pilots stopped and they asked themselves, is this thing still flying in the right direction? And the answer was yes. It was headed toward the moon. And so they let the lights glow as they addressed individual problems. They watched orange and red lights blink out one by one. That's something to think about in a pressure situation. If your thing is still flying, think first and then act. That's going to be a great lesson for us tonight as we look at where Daniel will find himself because in, in his day and time he was asking a question very similar to this. Is this thing still flying? And when the answer was yes, Daniel patiently addressed the issue at hand. So I think that's going to be real important for us. Remember, uh, the book of Daniel is uh, very much a moment of crisis uh, for the Jews. Again, we talked this morning about the book of Nehemiah, where that was. We're somewhat in that same time period. The Jews have been taken off into captivity, and uh, people have gone. The city of Jerusalem has been destroyed, been wiped out. And so what we find ourselves now, though, I'm focusing on a story that's away from Jerusalem, not about Jerusalem, but this is something that takes place Away, We're dealing with the Babylonians, Babylonian captivity at this particular point. We're going to start reading in Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. And we know from the verses that follow that four of those men that were chosen are ones that we have come to know as Daniel, and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so we'll need to keep those four in mind. Now, there was interesting... You have to remember in those verses that follow that the, the Babylonians really wanted to indoctrinate these men into the Babylonian culture, the Babylonian ways, and that even involved food and drink. But we remember from that part of the story that Daniel didn't want any part of that particular diet, and so he went to the officials and he said, we would prefer to stick to our regular diet, which is heavy on vegetables. And the official was somewhat leery of that, but he agreed to that. And what they found out is that by these four men adhering to that diet is they were quite healthy and quite fit for service. One more note that we need to remember out of chapter 1. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. That is very important as we turn the page to chapter 2. Uh, Daniel chapter 2 begins with the king turning to the wise men of the country. Start reading in chapter 2 verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled so that he could not sleep. So the king summoned all the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. And they came in and stood before the king, and he said to them, I've had a dream. It troubles me, and I want to know 
what it means. And so those magicians, those wise men, I'll just use that term, but I'm using it loosely. Those wise men said, that's great, king, just tell us what the dream is and we'll interpret it for you. And that is when Nebuchadnezzar uh, threw a wrench into the discussion. Chapter 2, verse 5. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your house turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Now all of a sudden things have gotten really complicated. Because he's had a dream, it troubled him. And so the wise men said, well tell us the dream and we will interpret it for you. And he's like, no, that's not the way this is going to work. I want you to tell me what my dream was and what it meant. And by the way, if you don't get it right, I'm going to cut you to pieces and I'm going to tear your houses down. Your memory will be wiped away from this land. Look down in chapter 2 verse 12. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Oh, it doesn't take long for Daniel to go from just being a captive to now showing some level of wisdom and the ability to interpret dreams. And, and now it, it seems like he hasn't had really anything to do with this as far as his interaction with the king. And next thing you know, he's on death row. Along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's keep going in the story, shall we? Remember the rule, okay? If this thing is still flying, don't panic. And for Daniel, the thing was still flying, so he didn't panic. Chapter 2, verse 14. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom intact. He asked the king's officer, Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Daniel did two things that are extremely wise. The first thing he did was to ask a wise question. And if you'll remember from our study last week, one of the things that we talked about that the right question asked at the right time in the right manner can open the door for understanding and new learning. And Daniel did just that. He was not afraid. To, he did not jump to assumptions. He wanted to gather information. And I think that is extremely important. I look at the church today and, and just think with me. Think back in your relationships, whether it's uh, in family, whether it's at work, in punity, or whether it's in church. How many times have we watched people jump to the wrong conclusion, to a, a quick conclusion without having all of the information had simply because wouldn't stop and ask good questions? Oh, and by the way, it may have been us that did that at times too, right? It is so important, church, for us to learn simple lessons from the Bible stories that we read. And Daniel did just that. He asked a good a wise question. And then he did a second thing that I think was really important. He asked for time. One of the things that we have to remember as we deal with matters is that some things are better resolved with time on our side. Every issue is not always as urgent as we make it out to be. And sometimes time can be a very good friend for us. I remember as a young man, I've probably told you this, I, I know some of you that, that have known me for a long time find this hard to believe, but at times I've been very impatient. And uh, I remember with elderships and with leaders in the church that they wouldn't make decisions fast enough for me. And I just get real frustrated with that. 
And, and I would even talk to some of our elders afterward, and I'd be, why can't you make a decision? What's taking so long? And in good elder fashion, they would just smile and say, Johnny, some things we just need to give time. And it's amazing to me of what will take place when there are matters that we will give time. Beware of the person, too, that wants to push us to make a, a, a rash or a quick decision. We need to take time to give matters to God, to take time to allow the learning that we have in Scripture and the answer that we'll receive from God. Give that time to work out. Daniel teaches us that lesson again. I, I love this uh, quote. This is from a guy by the name of Don Jones. He says, too often our first reaction is our worst reaction. We react out of self-pity, and certainly Daniel could have done this. He was being unfairly blamed, had not even been given the opportunity to defend himself. He had every right to act that way. However, instead of reacting with anger... Daniel reacted, or rather acted, in a calm, methodical manner. Church, great things happen when God's people pray. And that's what Daniel did. He didn't panic. Rather than letting anxiety be the rule of the day, he chose to take time and pray. There's a story that is told, uh, Catherine Marshall is the author, and it's in the book Stories for the Heart. She talks about a king that offered a prize for the artist who could paint the best picture of peace. Perhaps you've, you've read this yourself or you've, you've heard of this. A lot of artists tried, but it really boiled down to just two artists and the paintings that they submitted. Let me describe those if I could. One picture was of a calm lake. The lake was a perfect mirror for peaceful, towering mountains all around. Overhead was a blue sky with fluffy white clouds, and all who saw this picture thought that it was the perfect picture of peace. The other painting had a mountain too, but the mountains were rugged and bare. Above the sky was, was angry. Rain fell. Lightning was, was shown in the background. Down the side of the mountain tumbled a flowing, a foaming waterfall. Didn't look peaceful at all. But when the king looked closely, he saw behind the waterfall a tiny bush that was growing in the crack of a rock. And in that bush, a mother bird had built a nest. And in that nest was the mother bird and her small babies. There, in the midst of the rugged mountains, the lightning, the rain, the harsh waterfall, was a nest. The, bird, mother, the mother bird and the baby children at peace in the midst of the storm. And that's why the king chose that painting as the picture of perfect peace. You see, church, when what we need to look for is how we react in the middle of the storm. How we react when times are, are, are peaceful and calm. No offense, but that's easy. It's how we are going to react when life throws us that difficult moment. Can we find peace in the middle of the storm? What was it Jesus told the disciples? Remember, He's walking out to them on water. Remember, man, the wind's blowing and the waves are gushing. And the disciples were what? Afraid. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be terrified. I'm here. It's me. And church, we can find that kind of peace. I'm reminded of the, the words of Scripture where um, Paul tells us, you know, to don't live anxiety. But what does it we do? We present our requests to God. And when we do that, we will find a peace that passes Understanding. What is it that Peter says? Cast your cares unto Jesus, for He cares for you. Important words for us to remember. So Daniel has stopped. He's asked wise questions. He has asked for time. And now let's look in chapter 2, verse 19. 
During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Verse 20, he said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are His. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with Him. I thank and praise you, God, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Daniel didn't panic. By the way, something else we didn't read, if you go back and look at that, is that Daniel stopped and he asked, uh, he asked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to pray with him to carry this matter before God in prayer. And that was important for him. He didn't panic. He asked others to pray. And so then the prayer was answered. And what was the very first thing he did when the prayer was answered? He stopped and he praised God. I hope you notice that there is a strong theme of the day. Not only that we would be a people of prayer, but that we would praise God. Nehemiah, what did he do? He praised God at the very beginning of his prayer, at the beginning of the time of turmoil, before he offered any request to God. He praised God. Daniel here, as he prays, what does he do? The minute he receives the answer, he stops and he gives praise to God. Church, we need to be doing that. We praise God before the storm, during the storm, and after the storm. Because what we will do is we will find out, we will be reminded just how great God is. And Daniel knew that everything he was able to do right now wasn't because of his doing, because of his beating, because of some special talent that he had. It was everything that God had done for him and had done through him. And if we can remember that, that everything we have is a gift of God, everything that we're allowed to do, man, be thankful that God will allow you to be used as His servant at that time and in that place. What a great gift that is. And so Daniel has gotten the answer. He praises God. He gives God credit, by the way, twice. One of those is going to be in Daniel 2, verse 27 uh, Daniel replies, No wise man, enchanter, musician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. I love that. Man, before anybody wants to go, Daniel, way to go. No, 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 no. Daniel says, It's not me. Got to give all the credit to God. By the way, this dream, have you taken time to read through that yet? If you look down in red, it's a very complicated dream. And in all fairness, for context of the story tonight, our, our context is about looking at how Daniel reacts in the moment of crisis. However, just because the dream is a big part of the story, let's stop just for a minute. We're going to talk about that. The dream is really interesting. It talks about these different elements in nature and about the different statues that are made of that. And But ultimately, it, it, it points to the best we can tell, to four different kingdoms. And it seems at least good to think that those uh, kingdoms are going to be Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Some speculation about that, but there's decent agreement about that. The point is not what the four kingdoms are. The point is, is that God is greater than all the kingdoms. That's the point of the dream. And so again, whatever we might look at and study as part of that, remember the final sentence of the paragraph. And the final sentence is that God is greater than any of those kingdoms. Verse 45. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, not by human hands. A rock broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Again, Daniel is going to stop at this moment and he's going to give credit to God. And we know that. We can tell that and we can tell the impact of that. Look in verse 46 as we close out the story. 
King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and an incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position, lavished him with gifts. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Daniel got promoted, but he didn't forget his friends. He didn't forget the friends that had been selected with him in chapter 1, the ones that he had asked in chapter 2 to pray with him. And so now, as that prayer has been answered, and as he's promoted, he makes sure that his friends are remembered as well. It's a great lesson. The focus for us, if I can leave us with something very practical out of this, it really does boil down to this question, is how do we respond in the moment of crisis? Don't panic. That was the lesson from the astronauts, right? From the test pilots. Man, the lights can be blinking and the world can keep just going crazy around you, but at some point you just ask, is this thing still flying? And if the answer is yes, then don't panic. Be patient. Wait. We, we, we gather others around them and we ask them to pray for us. Ask them to pray with us. That's one of the things, man, if I could encourage this as a church, and I'm so appreciative of the things, the ones of you that have shared, even this day, of specific requests in your life, because, man, life throws all different kinds of crisis moments at us. But again, the key in the middle of that is we don't fight this battle alone. We have others that will join us in prayer. Ask questions, make sure we've got a full understanding, and then take time. And when God gives us the answer, we always give Him the praise and glory. This word crisis, by the way, is an interesting word. It's a, a Latin background uh, it was used by Hippocrates. And for Hippocrates, the word crisis had a special medical meaning. It was the turning point in a disease. And this is the way it's described, that at a certain point, a sick person either loses all hope or they start getting better. But that, Hippocrates would say, was the moment of crisis is that your condition either takes the turn downhill or you begin getting better. But that is the moment, that's the intersection where that takes place. And so I think for us, that when difficult moments come, we have an opportunity. And how will we respond? What will our crisis reaction be? You know, some people shut down. Some people take a bath in self-pity. Some people get angry. Some people blame God. But we have a choice. We have been given very biblical examples from very faithful men and women in Scripture of how to handle the difficult moments. It points to patience, it points to people, and it points to prayer. We want to be patient in how we respond, gathering the information. We want to ask others to join us in that time of prayer. And when those prayers are answered, add a fourth P, and that's the moment of praise to God. What a great lesson for us. You know, it may be that that crisis moment for some of us tonight is the opportunity we have to give our lives to Jesus. Making that right decision at that right time can make a difference for all eternity. I remember some years back having opportunity to talk to someone. This, um, this young lady was making a decision about giving her life to Jesus. 
and I was young at the time and, and, and lacked a lot of wisdom, but had a heart and a love for our teenagers as I was working with them. But I'll never forget the reaction. Man, I wish I, uh, I had known then what I know now. Because the decision was to put it off. Didn't see that it was necessary to make that decision at this point in life. Now, it's one thing to be patient in prayer, and it's another thing to put it off. And sometimes when we put it off and you want to think, well, there'll be another day. There hadn't been. Not yet. Not in years. And so when we have that opportunity to make the decision, make that decision. Don't be like Pharaoh. Do you remember when Pharaoh, there were frogs all around? It's one of the ten plagues. Frogs all around him. And Moses comes to him and says, I will give you the pleasure of of setting the time for me to pray for you for the frogs to leave the land. Do you remember what Pharaoh said? Tomorrow. Really? And what happened to him? His heart became hard. So when we are at that moment of crisis, that intersection, choose wisely. And for others of us, it can become very... um, can become very routine to come to church. We talk a lot about routines, not all bad. I hope that you have as a routine to read your Bible every day. I hope that you have a routine to pray every day. And I hope that you have a routine to be part of the assembly of God's people for class and worship as we come together. Those are great routines. But if we're not careful, what we think is a routine and has us on a, a path really can can have us at a moment where we become almost apathetic or we decline spiritually. We begin to take these moments for granted. And next thing you know, it's easier just be here, not pay attention, or, or to not be here. And I can misread my Bible just today. It's okay. And you can ask our teens. One of the great lessons out of this morning's Sunday school for them was to make sure that, that you don't take those moments for granted and of why that consistency is important. And so for those of us that have gotten and grown a little content and not in a healthy way in our spiritual life, every now and then there may be that lesson that kind of stirs us up just a little bit. That kind of has us thinking, maybe I I need to to wake up. Maybe Maybe I haven't been who I need to be for God. Now, did, did I say that you've been caught up in a major? I don't know. It may be, but it may be, church, that we're just, not, we're just not moving forward with the fire that we should have for God. And so when you find yourself at the end of a lesson, man, I, I do hope that you pay attention. I hope you take notes. I hope that at times there's something that is stirred. But I'll tell you this, at that moment of intersection, at that moment of crisis, respond to that. Sometimes it might mean coming forward, but I'll tell you this, other times it might mean that you need to go home and you need to sit at your table just a little bit longer with an open Bible of the lesson of the day. Give it opportunity to sink in a little more because it's real easy to put it off because you know Monday morning is just a few hours away. But don't do that. Don't let the routine of the world keep us from experiencing a revival for God, individually or as a church. So tonight we're going to close. I'm going to close with a song, and it may be that this is that moment of intersection for you. And if it is, and if there's a way that we can help you publicly, hope that you'll respond by coming to the front. Let's stand. Let's sing.